Did life begin at the bottom of the ocean? How has the ocean made life on land possible? Do you know life began on water? But the question is, how did life come on land? And what was the first species that moved to land? Want to know the answer to all these questions? Then stay with us till the end. Life began in water, and this assumption provides the backbone of the biogenesis theory that is widely accepted. Liquid water is excellent for life's inception and evolution. If we look at it, we'd see life in the oceans and rivers on the planet, in the soil, in the lower atmosphere, and even inside the volcano. What happened and why did life leave the ocean for arid land? Let's investigate. In the late Proterozoic, all life on the planet existed in the oceans. The Earth's atmosphere would fluctuate between huge ice caps, bleak dead stretches, and Ediacaran. The Proterozoic began 635 million years ago and lasted 94 million years. The planet wasn't very friendly back then. If today's humans were to encounter that era's atmosphere, they would die from suffocation due to low oxygen levels. The diachronic period's landscapes were limitless. Deserts and highlands were lifeless. The sea's coastline was teeming with strange organisms that had been delicate, non motile and nourished on fluid particles. These creatures lacked muscles, peripheral nerves, and a rigid shell without any attackers. All of this wasn't needed yet. Endodacrian predators appeared all of a sudden. To maintain their supremacy in the primordial ocean, aggressive hunting was a very successful survival tactic, as the delicate, non motile ocean bottom inhabitants were easy victims. The water provided a feast of meals for the earliest creatures. Most prehistoric meal items were short lived. 542 million years ago, some adapted to new hazards. Geological layers from that time are rich with fossils of once living, highly organized animals. These fossils suggest the primordial sea were full of life. An outer skeleton marked a significant milestone in the evolution of life on planet Earth and the start of the Phanerozoic one. Cambrian represents the first Phanerozoic eon. It lasted 542 million years. Trilobites are among the most famous and familiar creatures. The Cambrian is also known for their terrifying things. The prey predator cycle was finally created. In the millions of years that followed, natural circumstances interfered with food chains, killing off some species and boosting others. Bredation remained the principle. The Cambrian explosion became a tremendous drive for evolution, forcing animals to alter to face fresh challenges and explore various areas inaccessible to predators. It created numerous new species. Many new kinds and wild varieties of biological organizations failed and disappeared from the world. Others introduced new species. These organisms are among the earliest vertebrae predecessors. Pikaia came next. These tiny organisms resembled flatworms or rudimentary fish with flexible spines and muscles. They swarm by wiggling in S-shaped motions. This rapid and efficient swimming enabled chorodates to endure and develop into more complex species. Mostly, all Cambrian fossils are aquatic creatures as most species existed in the ocean then. Some fossil creatures look strange and scary. The oldest fossils of land soil stretch back 530 million years to the middle and late Cambrian. These impressions reveal that primitive algae and microbes ventured onto land and flourished during this period. They died and decayed feeding their offspring. Initially, microbe communities would have developed in moist, warm regions with ample water, sunlight, and no predators to devour them. Thus, algae thrived. Single-cell algae were soon followed by primitive fungi that couldn't generate nutrition but could feast on decaying weeds. Eventually, fungi and single-cell algae symbiosis form lichens. These little things might help explore vast new horizons. The Ordovician period succeeded the Cambrian and lasted 42 million years. When aquatic life evolved rapidly, mollusks and anthropods thrived among the Europarids, many of which lived at the bottom. To move about, they used jointed limbs. This characteristic would eventually be an essential acid and key to land adaption. In addition, jawless animals like lampreys and cartilage fish evolved while vegetation slowly moved inland. First, land-living multicellular plants appeared. They left behind spores and animals didn't leave their habitats. This period finished with the Ordovician Silurian extinction catastrophe. Therefore, crustaceans may have explored coastal regions. Its reasons are unknown. Based on the most prevalent explanation, it was caused by a global glacial period and a drop in the worldwide ocean level. Therefore, 
up that 50% of all creatures disappeared. After the extinction, life adapted to new circumstances and reached a new level. The Silurian Epoch lasted 444 to 419 million years ago, when huge arthropods inhabited the seas. One may find a Eurypterid up to 2.5 meters in length. Large, quick predators over 1 meter long also thrived. Some species left the water to seek secure homes, which was when the earliest arthropods arrived on land. Their thick, ketonous exoskeleton shielded them from heat and dryness and retained their body structure. Tiny legs helped them walk on land. First, arthropods on land likely stayed near water. Their lungs needed moisture. Arthropods need plant nourishment to function correctly. That was near the sea. The land was also attractive, since predators hadn't learned to pursue food that moved to land slowly. Around 419 million years ago, the Devonian Epoch began, which was among the most significant in geographical exploration and lasted for 60 million years. Rhinophytes, prehistoric vascular plants, and predecessors of mosses and ferns roamed across the Earth then. They encompassed all warm and moist places on Earth, especially seacoasts and river deltas. Yet neither rhinophytes nor mosses and lichens that arose subsequently possessed a functional root system. They replant primitive rootstocks. Soils soon flow into rivers, turning them into filthy streams and deltas into wetlands. Plants thrived in these moist, organic-rich regions, feeding bugs and other ancient earthlings. Insects and larvae drove fish to swampy places. Ultimately, putrefying organic materials drained oxygen from marsh water, affecting animals' respiration. To cope with the absence of oxygen, fish in those seas evolved to a breathing sac, enabling them to live beyond their aqueous homes. Thick stalks and stems of swamp plants provided fish a refuge from predators. They had trouble navigating these thickets. Thin fins didn't work. More substantial limbs were needed. Thus, fish in swampy areas acquired longer fins. Early lungfish had more bones with strong muscles connected. Psychoptergy usphenapterin is an example. Although this strong finned fish didn't like land, it could inhale air from the atmosphere and survive out of water for short durations. Shallow wetlands often dried up, so their occupants had to travel to more moist locations, which required them to pass land. Acanthus steger, which existed 365 million years ago in the late Devonian had gills, scales, and a tail fin. This intriguing species had four legs and an amphibious-like respiratory bag to breathe air. Acanthus steger's limbs couldn't sustain the body weight and its thoracic muscle could not pump oxygen for long. It remained in the water, creeping from one water body to the other. Prehistoric psychoptergy capacity to inhale atmospheric air strengthened their fins and transformed them into pores. Their looks changed. Tiktaalik, a prehistoric sarcoptogen amphibian fish that existed approximately in the same period as the Canthan steger, used to have a flat head like a frog. Tiktaalik had strong fins that could support and sustain its body and move it on solid surfaces. Its ostacle shape shows that Tiktaalik can identify land and water sounds. All such clues demonstrate that this species spent nearly as much time out of the water as it did in the Cambriniferous era. After that, Devonian amphibians moved into land to stay, establishing all kinds of ecosystems in their revolution. Then reptiles and synapsids evolved. Land dwellers are subjected to a broader range of weather conditions and other circumstances than sea dwellers, which accelerated evolution. Why did animals just once evolve onto land? Why haven't sea creatures gone on land in 350 million years? The answer is simple. Marine life is adaptable. Most are weak and powerless in water. They require a new skeleton, skin, or shell out of the water. In addition, respiration, vision, and hearing a fish out of water is much more vulnerable than a human in the open sea. Hence, standard fish are fair game for any terrestrial animal. When moving onto land in the Paleozoic period, plants, arthropods, and vertebrates occupied unoccupied ecosystems. They didn't have natural predators and food was abundant in the new surroundings. The primary negative feature of the foreign atmosphere was the lack of water. Not animals, but circumstances. Luckily, the species adapted slowly. Prehistoric cetacean ancestors return to aquatic life. Terrestrial adaptions are more complex and diversified. Survival may require getting back into the water. Whales, dolphins, and other secondary aquatic dwellers of oceans 
seas and rivers prove evolution is reversible. Thanks for watching. See you later.